Well, this will be different. <laughs> um, I'm honored to be here. Uh, and, um, you know, I am associated with a lot of mushroom people, mycological societies. And uh, it's very interesting meeting the, the bee people because there's a real interesting bridge that's being built now between the mushroom people and the bee people. So I hope that bridge becomes stronger, especially after this talk. Um, so um, this talk will be incorporated into my talk tonight. Uh, my talk tonight is an immersion talk. It goes into the science of the adventure stories of scientific discovery ever since I was a child. Um, so I encourage you to come. Um, and so I, um, well, like, I brought a few of my mushroom friends here. But first off, this is my favorite hat. I think it makes me look handsome, frankly. <laughs> um, and I'm balding on top, so it covers that. Um, and this, uh, this hat is made from a mushroom called Amadou. Amadou has a Latin name of Fomis fomentarius. It's a birch polypore. It grows on birch trees. It's hard, like a woodcock. It's a perennial. It grows for about seven years maximum. Um, and this mushroom uh, allowed for the portability of fire. There's no doubt that we all came from Africa about 40,000 years ago. We migrated north and we did, into Europe. We discovered something new called winter. Oops. <laughs> And if you could not keep fire alive, your, your clan would likely perish. And so this mushroom allows for the portability of fire. You can hollow it out, put embers of a fire inside, and carry fire for days. Not long, too long ago, before Bic lighters and matches, you know, the fire keeper of, of indigenous peoples was held literally life and death in their hands by keeping fire alive, especially during the winter time. So you put this mushroom into lye water, ashes and water mixed together, and you let it soak for a few days, and it delaminates. And you can pull this mushroom apart into mycelium. And the mushrooms are made of mycelium. Um, and this is a thread of knowledge that's existed for thousands of years. Um, and these hats are made now by one village um, in Transylvania, by a small group of ladies. Uh, there's one guy that's also making them too. But there was up to 25 of these hat makers um, a few years ago. Now there's only about three or four. So the Amadou mushroom um, is not only important for portability of fire, and you can make clothes out of it. It's very, very warm. Um, we smear animal grease on it, our ancestors did, to make it waterproof because it's extremely water absorbing. Um, but also, it's very interesting that this fabric it was used by fly fishermen to uh, dry their flies, you know, because it's very water absorbent. Uh, and moreover, very interestingly, it was used uh, by beekeepers for hundreds of years for smoking the hives. So an interesting connection there. Moreover, this mushroom is the first mushroom ever found to have an antiviral property against the mosaic uh, viruses that plague a lot of plants. So it's, it's this mushroom, and I think shamanistically, mushrooms become, or plants or animals, become spiritually important because of a confluence of a multiplicity of benefits. And I think this mushroom is one represent, representation of that. So anyhow, this is, this is my favorite, and I have, I'm going to ambush Jeff now. Jeff, come up here. I got you your own hat. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> you have now entered into a cult. <laughs> so. Okay, so um, this is a, uh, a, a I, can, I hired an artist and did a fabulous job. I'm very much important, if those people are mushroom experts out there, it's really important that mushrooms are taxonomically correct. So every species that you see in this portrait is a mushroom that we've explored for their benefits uh, to bees. But let me go back in history first. This is, there's an original, the oldest pictograph showing anything related to mushrooms is this one from 7,000 years ago. It's been redrawn, the second image here, in northern Algeria on the Tassilian Anjar Plateau. This is a plateau in the Sahara Desert now is encroached. The Tassilian Anjar Plateau literally translates to the plateau of running rivers. But there's a, it's now that desertification has occurred, there's a labyrinthine cave complex, literally hundreds and hundreds of caves. And these explorers in 1947, Lahote and Yamaguchi, French anthropologists and Japanese anthropologists, explored these caves and they went into this ca deep in the labyrinth and they're running out of water. They absolutely did not anticipate that there wouldn't be any water. Um, and they were getting very severe conditions. They went burrowing you know, deeper and deeper into the caverns and they found this little corridor that one of them crawled through and he held up his lantern and almost dropped it in, in fright because this looming figure, uh, there's about seven of these figures in this cave complex. Now, 
it's um, really interesting because even though it was published in scientific, several scientific journals, not a single scientist would dare speculate what the artist's intention was. Can you believe it? This obviously this artist is very excited about mushrooms, you know? Um, so, but that that's represents what we call mycophobia, the irrational fear of fungi, and actually permeates the sciences. You know, scientists do not want to may, be made fun of. You know, they don't want to be humiliated. They want tenure. They can't say crazy things. Um, so, but this, is, this actually has held back the understanding of the importance of role of mushrooms in the ecosystem and medicine and, um, and elsewhere. Um, so, but there's a long history, some of you know, of putting magic mushrooms in honey. This is now continues in Mexico and South America. So the hallucinogenic psilocybe mushrooms are preserved in honey. Um, and I suspect, hypothetically, I'll tell you the difference between hypotheses is without any evidence, could be circumstantial. Theories is with evidence. You actually have something that you've been able to prove. Uh, so this is a hypothesis um, that um, I know from my own experiences of putting these mushrooms in, in the honey, they start fermenting the honey. The honey. Mm -hmm. And so this may have led to ma magical mushroom meads, psychoactive, uh, basically beer, honey beer. Uh, but the Beer Purity Act of 1560 um, was promoted largely for two reasons. The, um, the non-religious reason was to protect the rye and wheat resources for making bread. Because if everyone started making beer out of rye and wheat, there wouldn't be enough rye and wheat for making bread. Um, so the Beer Purity Act banned everything except for uh, hops, uh, you know, barley, you know, hops, uh, 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 yeast and, and, and water. Uh, so that was the, the Bear Purity Act. And so uh, mushrooms were specifically mentioned to be excluded. And there's been a history of the use of mushrooms prior to the Beer Purity Act of adding mushrooms into the beer for religious ceremonies by pagans. So there's, there's the other monotheistic, the Christian movement was trying to basically suppress paganism. And so they wanted uh, the people not to be engaging in the these magical mushroom mystery tours. Okay, so there's a connection there. I'm trying to draw connections here to the bee community, you can see. So this is a, a simplified view of the mushroom life cycle. Mushrooms produce spores, two spores come together, they're opposite sexes, they fuse. The downstream union then is mycelium, and this mycelial state can list, exist for weeks, months, years, and then the mushrooms come up, and typically fleshy mushrooms come up and disappear within a few days. Now, it's not, it's, it's understandable why people have a fear of mushrooms because in your viewscape with plants and animals, you have that experiential experiences with them for months, years. So you have a familiarity factor. But something that comes up and disappears in four or five days that can feed you, that can kill you, that can heal you medicinally, or send you on a psychoactive spiritual journey, and yet disappears, that, that your, your experiential window to gain knowledge is extremely limited. So it's, it's natural that people would be resistant of something that's so powerful, yet they don't understand. So the mycelium can take a variety of forms, but this is it's highly tenacious, and tonight I'll talk more about the attributes of mycelium. Um, but this is what the mycelium looks like. You've all seen it. Just go outside, find a piece of wood on the ground. It's been on the ground for a few weeks or months. Push it over. You'll see mycelium everywhere. Um, so. I've been growing uh, mushrooms ever since I was about 17 years of age. And this is the garden giant mushroom. This is kind of the gateway species to what I think is um, a profound epiphany that I had <coughs> over, it, it took 30 years to have this epiphany. So it's like, like not something, I'm, I'm not that brilliant. But this is the garden giant mushroom. It's a huge mushroom. Um, when it's young, it's, it's, it's called burgundy caps. When it's young, it's very bright red. Um, and then um, these up, this, is a, uh, this is a three pound specimen, that's a two pound specimen, these are five pound specimens. Uh, so it's a really beautiful mushroom to go in the garden, it's extremely compatible with garden plants, it helps them grow. But one day, in 1984, I had two beehives, um, and this is about 12 inches high, it goes down, and this is full of mycelium, and I inoculated it, um, and this is in July, and uh, one day I'm out there, I have to water my mushrooms, and. Uh, the mushrooms, for some reason, were white. This is a burgundy cap. They're supposed to be red, like burgundy wine. Why are they white? Well, I went out to my garden giant patch, and lo and behold, I couldn't believe what I saw. I found that my bees from my beehives were coming to my garden giant patch, and I looked at them very, very carefully, um, and I was able to see that, whoops, that they were, um, they were um, moving the wood chips aside to expose the mycelium. And for, I kept a diary, and for 40 days, 
from dawn to dusk, I had a continuous convoy of bees going from my beehives right to this patch, even though there's all sorts of other flowers in the area. There was a direct convoy. The mycelium was about this thick. And over 40 days, it sucked the mycelium patch down so it was about this deep. A tremendous amount of mass was able to, that they were able to, to con consume. So I was like really excited. I go, well, well they, the, when the mycelium breaks down wood, there's, it releases sugars. Uh, mushrooms are about 75% sugar, car uh, carbohydrates and polysaccharides. So maybe it's the extracellular metabolites were a sweet juice. So I, I mentioned this and I published it in Harrow Smith Magazine in 1988. And then I put it in one of my books in 1994, Growing Gourmet and Medicinal Mushrooms, saying this is a kind of extraordinary observation. I don't know what it means. And I had one beekeeper from, from, from Ottawa said, well, maybe that's why bees go to sawdust piles in the summertime. I was always curious about that, but sometimes they could forage and it's not as possible. Okay, so I'm gonna put now a string of experiences together. And tonight, this string is much longer, but for the sake of this uh, short talk. Um, so you, we have that experience, okay? And so, okay, then, and I have to say that these were Kodachrome 64 slides. And when I had this uh, sort of growing epiphany, I went up in my attic in 110 degree heat and looking for you know, thousands of slides. And I found the two slides finally that, that had this. Um, so I spend a lot of time in the old growth forest. This is some of my passions. I have about 700 species in culture. I have a tissue culture laboratory. I have 75 employees. We grow about 20,000 kilos of that mycelium per week. So we create enormous, you know, truckloads of mycelium. This is something I'm an in vitro culture specialist. I do lots of in vitro propagation in the laboratory cloning, you know, fungi basically. And so it's, I was always fascinated by bears and uh, on trees and the interaction between the two. Oh, well, bears grass trees, but the timber industry and the forest industry, and for three years I set chokers in the woods. I was a rig and slinger, I, I was a logger. I pulled on the green chain in a, in a sawmill and I, I ran cut off in a shingle mill. I also was a cedar rat in the Olympics. Some of you guys, the people know this, and I slung bolts, you know, under helicopters. Um, so I had a lot of experience, you know, in the school of hard knocks, just being in the woods. And I was fascinated by bears, and um, and in where area where I live, there's over 400 bears that were killed by my neighbor, who was given a paid a bounty by the Forest Service and the timber uh, industry to kill the bears because they scratch trees, and when they scratch trees, then fungus comes in, kills the tree, so it hurts their bottom line. So classic misguided attempt, because now we know from researchers here in British Columbia that bears actually when they pull salmon out of streams up on the bank is returning sea phosphorus and sea minerals and as a limiting mineral nutrient for the growth of trees. And so when they build bears, pull up the salmons and the coyotes and birds, you know, bald eagles, kind of spread the, that phosphorus and other uh, elements, you know, throughout the forest and actually helps the ecosystem. Humans are so good at doing exactly opposite their long-term interests. Um, so, and here's a bear scratch, and this is typical bear scratch that you see on birch trees. Um, and then on the fir trees, and many of you know that uh, bees are attracted to tree resins for propolis, for patching their hives, the wild, the wild bees, and uh, for antimicrobial connection um, uh, benefit. So I'm in the hiking in the South Fork of the Hope in the Olympic National Forest of Washington State. I come around the corner, I see this bear scratch. I mean, this bear came up, bam, you know, and uh, so I like doing that. Um, and <laughs> so it's the best bear scratch I've ever seen. So I'm there with my wife, Dusty, uh, and a friend, and I said, you know, this is really interesting because I told him the story about why the bears were all killed you know, in our area. Um, I said, you know, if this is true, let's come back here in two years. Let's find this tree and see what happened. Um, because the literature said a mushroom called the red belted polypore uh, is the primary uh, fungus that kills the trees from bear scratches. And so it causes a brown rot. So I orienteer in the old growth, I go off trail. So it took us about four hours um, in the old growth forest, this is three miles in the lower South Fork of the Hoe, and I finally found the tree, you know, and I, we brought a photocopy of the printout of what the original tree looked, and there's, there's a tree. And lo and behold, by gosh, the red belted polypore was growing out of that tree. Now this is a different tree, but it basically has a wound here. So basically, wounds on trees are entry points for mushrooms, particularly Phomitopsis panicula, the red belted polypore. So I went, oh, that's interesting, because I'm involved in micro -reveniation. So it turns out this, this mushroom, I knew well, not only because it's extremely common, you've all seen it, it's the most common polypore in the woods. Um, it breaks down a variety of pesticides. Uh, this bioremediation with fungi is called microremediation. 
So it breaks down all sorts of xenobiotic, you know, herbicides, fungicides, you know, DDT, uh, insecticides, et cetera. So um, I thought, oh, that's interesting. Well, huh, there's a connection between bears and mushrooms, the connection between bees coming to my garden giant patch, and then my friend Louis Schwartzberg, who's a National Geographic and Walt Disney slow-mo, fast-mo photographer, filmmaker, I have um, has been using entomopathogenic fungi, fungi that kill insects. Um, and I have seven patents in this area uh, against um, termites, carpenter ants, mosquitoes, flies, et cetera, um, bed bugs. And um, so Louis said, well, Paul, can you do something to help the bees? Because I really wasn't tuned into mites. And he goes, oh, I'm doing all this research and filming these beekeepers are under assault by the varroa mite. And I said, oh, you know, that, that was interesting. I, I have some experience with entomopathogenic fungi. You know, mites and ticks are related. So oh, let me think about that. Well, I started doing my research. Many of you have seen this, the presidential memorandum that came out. And then Michelle covered this very nicely today, and other people have as well, is that the stressors, you know, bee nutrition, of course, forage lands are being restricted, parasites, especially mites, pathogens being introduced, and especially mites introducing viruses, lack of genetic diversity, and exposure to, to neonics uh, in particular, uh, uh, ne ne neonicotinoids. So um, this is something, now this is a, an insecticide kill, right? This is not from, uh, from the colony collapse, this typically occurs. So I, this is kind of my education. I've gone, okay, I started doing some reading, I'm paying attention to this. And um, thanks to Whole Foods, I mean, there's a great um, a graphic, I'm not sure if anyone else has shown this before, this is your food at Whole Foods uh, with the benefit of bees. And if we didn't have bees, this is what your dairy selection would look like. It's pretty dramatic. So I started really focusing on, I'm involved in um, biosecurity. And I work with the US Defense Department. I'll be talking about that um, tonight, you know, studying fungi that have activity against pox viruses, um, herpes, and flu viruses. And I've published quite a bit on that you know, just recently. So I started paying attention to food biosecurity in general. In fact, farming creates zoonotic diseases that go from pig farms, ca cattle farms, and, uh, and those diseases can emanate outwards. So, you know, I was like, I was really interested. Well, there's factory farming going on with, with bees, so that's, that's, that's a concern. So, um, so the New York Times, you know, and many of you have seen these stories, uh, it's a threat to world global food <coughs> supply. Now, the, everyone has different stats, but you know, I, I'm reference driven, but the stats that I've seen is colony collapse you know, as a syndrome has gone from 36% to 44% in the United States from 2014 to 2015. Some entomologists have told me that they are concerned about total collapse of commercial pollination services within the next decade, unless this can be lassoed in, unless we find some solutions. Now, this article came out, some of you said you've seen it, it came out just a few weeks ago about neonicotinoids reducing the drone lifespan and sperm uh, uh, quality by more than 30%. In my view is the war against nature is a war against your own biology. And that the idea of the magic bullet and chemical solutions to fix immediate problems likely is gonna have ramifications throughout the ecosphere that's gonna be deleterious to many other members within the ecosystem. So I, I, I'm laying in bed and I like the state between being fully asleep and then in the wakefulness. And I like to get into that sort of ether of subconsciousness. And then I started having these connections and I, I had this epiphany. And I go, oh my God, I think I have a potential tool or solution to help save the bees. I got real excited. I called the University of California Davis Eh, they weren't too receptive. <laughs> I called up Steve Shepard. I was at TED. I got out of the TED conference. I sat down and called Steve Shepard. I said, Steve, listen, just hear me out for 20 minutes, okay? Let me tell you my premise here. And Steve said, don't go anywhere else. I want to work with you. So Steve Shepard, you may be the person who has changed his history because of that conversation. So Steve and I, I've been working together. You'll see some of this research, but PBS did a short little movie on us. It's five minutes long. Uh, some of the characters you will recognize. And so I'm going to show this little five-minute five PBS movie that introduces some of the work that Steve and I have been doing. So let's see Dan at this. Wow. Very nice. These girls are fantastic. 
I lift that lid up and those girls are slawing across there and they're making honey and they're making babies. Eric Olson owns more colonies than any beekeeper in Washington State. Hot dog! There's nothing greater than to open a beehive and see him doing well. They're doing well today. Look at that! They were really tickled a bit. But just months ago, he opened his hives and discovered nearly half his bees were dead. I spent 20 years as a pilot in the Air Force in my share of combat situations, and I never was as low as I was when all those bees were dead. That's the lowest time of my life. It turns out this may be the new normal. The U.S. Department of Agriculture says that nearly half of colonies across the country died in the 2014 season. Big losses have been happening for years, and scientists haven't pinpointed what's causing them. They say more than 60 factors may play a role in collapsing colonies. Factors like pesticides, malnutrition, and loss of habitat. If we don't find some answer, I am really concerned about whether these little girls will survive. But one unlikely solution may be growing close by, in the forests of western Washington. Enter Paul Stamets. He's a pioneer in the study of mushrooms. This is a beautiful specimen. The white margin here means it's growing really well. What I call happy mushrooms. Makes me a happy person too. I'm involved in the study of fungi ever since a very young age. My initial interest was magic mushrooms, and then I got into edible mushrooms and medicinal mushrooms, and my mother was much happier. <laughs> Stamets scours the forest for rare types of fungi. I use mycology and the use of fungi to help clean up the environment, improve the immune system of animals, and I began to think. We've gone to the moon, we've gone to Mars, and we don't know the way of the bee. All right. You know, actually I can do something to help the bees. Stamets recently discovered a mushroom that might be able to take on one of the honeybees' worst enemies. That's called the Varroa mite, with the, the name Varroa Destructor. Varroa mites began wreaking havoc on U.S. beehives in 1996. We lost about half the colonies east of the Mississippi over that winter. Steve Shepard is an entomologist at Washington State University. He spent decades trying to understand how Varroa mites cripple honeybees. He says they invade hives and attach themselves to infant bees. I always think of it as having something about the size of a pancake beating on you. They live off bee blood and transmit a slew of viruses to their hosts. Some sickly bees lose the ability to fly and gather food for the hive. Many end up dying prematurely. They'll kill the colony within a couple of years unless beekeepers intervene. <laughs> That's why Shepard decided to try a new approach. Well, something doesn't look quite right with that. Yeah, it'll never fly. He teamed up with Paul Stamets. Stamets told him about a type of fungus that's highly attractive and highly lethal to termites. Shepard wondered what this termite-killing mushroom extract would do to the varroa mite. So we should uh, do something with this. Yeah. Ready? He recently started testing the product on bees in his lab. So we take bees from colonies with high mite levels. We set up numerous cages some with fungus. They're finding that the product is killing mites without harming bees. It's certainly uh, encouraging so far. And that's not all that mushrooms can do for bees. Bees have immune systems, just like we do. And these mushrooms, they're like miniature pharmaceutical factories. Their initial results show that certain forest mushrooms can reduce viruses in bees and help them live longer. I think I've discovered now that the fungi that are rotting the logs are absolutely critical for the immunological health of the bees. This is a really interesting potential breakthrough in understanding how nature works and how we co-evolve the fungi. Shepard and Stamets plan to expand both experiments by partnering with commercial beekeepers. 
Eric Olson was the first to sign up. Yeah, I don't have too much hair left. Uh, I have pulled my hair out. We just can't seem to get a control on the Varroa mite. We've got our fingers crossed. The future of Western honeybee colonies and the billions of dollars of crops they pollinate may depend on it. So this aired on several hundred um, PBS uh, stations, also I think in C CBC here. Um, so this is a, a scanning electron micrograph of Varroa mite. And this is the fungus of greatest interest. It's called Metarhizium inosipli. Um, it's an entomopathogenic fungus. It acts, it parasitizes uh, mites um, and also many other insects, but surprisingly uh, not bees, probably because of the hairs, you know, that keeps the spores away from the exoskeleton. Um, and um, the metarhizium has been really carefully studied uh, for applications for controlling many insects. But there's something, some of you are familiar with Kanga's research of a few years ago, funded by the a California uh, Bee Association. And uh, Kanga is a good researcher, published an article showing high lethality of uh, metarhizium against the varroa mite. Uh, he got several hundred thousand dollars, I believe, and, um, and did a series of experiments which utterly failed. Now, for us mycologists, we use the American Type Culture Collection, the largest repository of cultures in the world, in Maryland, and in that DC area. And so um, when we need a new culture, after our culture dies or doesn't grow well, then we resource back to the American Type Culture Collection and we pull that culture. So um, looking at Kangas research, I was quite surprised that it failed. So we ordered some of the cultures from the American Type Culture Collection, and lo and behold, I, and this is a hypothesis, I don't know, this is true, but this is what happened with us. When we got the cultures from this prestigious culture bank, the best in the world, and we grew them out, we ended up getting a mixed culture. We had two fungi. The culture was contaminated. So I suspect that Kanga's work did not come to fruition because he ended up getting, because within the same stock that he got his culture is where we got this culture that was contaminated. Um, so anyhow, that set back the research of using metarhizium, you know, varroa mites substantially because the results were not good. Well, this is brand new research that WSU and my company, Fungi Perfecti, are collaborating on. Uh, so this has never been shown before, the next series of, of images. So this is Nick, uh, Nick uh, Nagler. Come on, Nick. Oop, I'm sorry. This is Nick Nagler here, and these are uh, hives, uh, 10 control hives, uh, 10 hives uh, that were treated with this fungus, metarhizium. And here's uh, the, the illustrious Dr. Shepard here, uh, holding a culture of metarhizium, anisoply, and one of these cultures goes into four hives. Um, so we started doing some experiments, and um, I thought about, you know, I, all these elaborate models and bait stations and delivery systems, and you, get, you can over-engineer stuff. And I thought, you know, what? keep it simple, stupid, right? Kiss. And I thought, you know, I grow out thousands of Petri dishes. It's so easy to grow them out. Why don't we have the delivery system just the Petri dish? And so we put the Petri dish on top of the frames here, and, this, and the bees immediately start, you know, consuming it. Um, and then one, two days later, they've scavenged it all away. So they spread the fungus throughout the, in, the entire uh, the entire hive. So this is the research that just got completed this past week. Um, this is the first time this has been done by WSU and myself for that matter. This is uh, the controls, sporulating versus non-sporulating. We have statistical significance on days five through seven. Now it's important to mention this because we're using an, a, a strain of metarhizium anisoply that's never been trained to attack varroa mites. It's been trained for attacking termites. Um, and this thing in science that's really big these days is that we call it's called epigenesis. It's the elicitation, uh, the elicitate, elicitation of a genomic expression in response to an external stimulus. You know, you can you can adapt, and then you upregulate gene sequences that help you better survive. And so um, this is the we had not significance over here. The trend lines are good, but now what we are doing, and this is what I have recommended, and this is classic way of training and developing new strains. We took uh, Nick and Lori Karras and our team, uh, Jennifer and Steve and Brandon Hopkins, uh, you know, we took out an infected varroa mite and then put it into a petri dish and then they confirmed that this, this varroa mite was killed by metarhizium. So we do DNA analysis and microscopy, make sure that's the right fungus because oftentimes you get co-occurring fungi 
Just like if you die, die from one disease, you can have as, uh, aspergillus, or you can have other yeast infections that can proliferate because you're immunologically depressed because of the, the primary organism that is killing you is suppressing your immune system to opportunistic infections occur. So then, then we will sequence this. So we then we'll grow out this mycelium and we'll repeat the experiment. We'll give it to the bees again. And it might fall on day three, which is you know, pretty fast for these mites to die from exposure from this fungus. Then we'll repeat it, repeat it, repetitively do this over and over and over again, trying to navigate to find a super highly virulent strain that is species specific to the varroa mite that can kill the varroa mites as quickly as possible without harming the bees. So that's some of the research that we're doing uh, concurrently with this, this, these other research that I'm about to show you. So, you know, I'm such an idiot sometimes. I'm so stupid. I just, I, I, I stare at things, they hit me. But I like it when things made the covers of journals. <laughs> that makes it really easy to find. And um, so it was this, this basically, in this uh, Panas um, uh, open source journal that many of you know about, they were looking at, at the honey constituents and bees, the, the colonies that suddenly, you know, lost all of their bees uh, and it went, it went through colony collapse. They, they analyzed the honey and they found something extraordinary is that the honey lacked p chimeric acid. Now, p chimeric acid controls the cytochrome P450 pathway. All animals have it. We have it mostly in our liver. It's your detoxification pathway. And uh, humans have about 80, 80 genes for this. Most insects have uh, around 60, but bees only have 47 genes that code for the cytochrome P450 pathway, which is controlled by p chimeric acid. Well, I knew what p chimeric acid is. It's related to vanilla, and it's when mycelium produces it when it degrades wood. So when wood is being delignified and lignin and cellulose are being decomposed, the little sweat droplets are, are forming, uh, p chimeric acid is being produced. And I'm like, oh, well, I know if they're lacking p chimeric acid, maybe they don't have access to fungi rotting wood. Well, that speaks to habitat loss, deforestation. Huh, that kind of makes sense. And so then an article came out then this, uh, in 2013 saying glyphosates interfere with the cytochrome P450 pathway. This is uh, really important. This is something that Monsanto doesn't want really, they, they fight against this knowledge constantly for profit reasons. But so glyphosates are, are interfering with, with the cytochrome P450 pathway and bees are being exposed to that. So again, it's a confluence, it's multifactorial. There's lots of stressors that bees are undergoing. Many of you have different opinions about that and you're all probably right. But I'm, I'm focused on fungal biology. Well, let's go back, and, and so it turns out, in studying the P-chimeric pathway, uh, the mycelium is growing, it's eating up wood, so it produces these sweat droplets that can, contain enzymes, lacases. And the lacases are being produced, um, and then when the mycelium reaches up to, uh, to the surface of the ground, it's exposed to light. Most of you may not know that 99% of all mushrooms need light. They have no chlorophyll, but without light, the mushrooms will not form. They'll stay in the mycelial state and not in a mushroom state. And so, as it turns out, the light bandwidth that's most uh, promoting for mushroom for, uh, formation is uh, around 320 nanometers. We see down to about 400. Bees see down to 320, and there's articles out there, some of you may have read them, that you can train bees with blue light very, very quickly to be associated with uh, rewards. And so, studying when the mycelium comes up and exposed to light, ultraviolet light, lac cases stop because now mycelium doesn't have to digest and the mushrooms are going to form. And when that light stimulation occurs, p chimeric acid stops, lac cases stops, and tyrosinase is coded for. Tyrosinase creates pigments. And then it dawned on me, oh my gosh, that's why probably my mushrooms were not burgundy color, they were white. Because the bees were taking out and interfering with the tyrosinase pathway by moving the wood chips that still have p chimeric acid but then the wood chips are, the mycelium is exposed to light, so it cu cuts off that pathway. So I thought, oh, wow, this is interesting. Is it possible that bees are flying around and they can see in the blue spectra? And they're looking for a blue mycelium because that has p chimeric acid. It can help the cytochrome P450 pathways to break down xenobiotic toxins that they're exposed to, and sexicide, pesticides, et cetera. So I'm going, okay, this is possible. <laughs> no, keep with me here, okay. So, <laughs> so. Then we thought, okay, if they like mycelium, why don't we make myco honey? This is no honey. This is all mycelium grown on rice. And then we create this like nutraceutical of various forms now we've given to Steve. 
So we started doing longevity tests, 100 bees in a cage at WSU. This is Steve's work. And they get uh, sugar water, 50% sugar, 50% uh, wa uh, water. And then we gave them three of our extracts at different concentrations, at 10%, 1%, and 0.1%. And Steve, is, I, this says a lot about him. Steve's number one concern was, I don't want to hurt my bees, Paul. Do you understand that? I don't want to hurt my bees. This is not going to hurt my bees now, is it? I go, no, Steve. Trust me, it won't hurt your bees. So it was very nice. So we did these longevity uh, uh, tests. And um, then uh, you folks all know about sugar water, so I don't have to go into that. So we, scanned, we screened about tw uh, 12 species, I think, so far today. And so I'm going to go through the summary of our data here. Interestingly, the, major the species that have the greatest benefits seem to be associated with birch trees or young fir trees. And it is the red belted polypore that the bears primarily introduced, or woodpeckers can too, but bears, you know, from bear scratches. It is chaga. Here, it also grows on birch trees. And then amadou, which my hat is made of, which beekeepers for hundreds of years, you know, smoked hives with. And then the red reishi mushroom, which is this one here, which has a long history of immunological benefit you know, throughout Asia and elsewhere. So here is the first set of data that we received. This is from Amadou, the one my hat is made from. Highly significant, most of the bees die in 30 days. High, highly significant, showing there's more than a doubling in the lifespan, as they have caged bees, oh, I'm a, compared to the controls. So longevity factors were increased. Hmm, well, you know, it, it, there's the sugars, there's peak chimeric acid, you know, the activation of the detoxification pathways. That's interesting. And then Steve made this remark, you know, and said, as an entomologist for 39 years studying bees, he's never seen anything that extended the, the life of worker bees more than this. Then when we went to the red belted polypore, the one the bears introduced, um, then we found that a higher concentration actually was toxic. But at this concentration here, um, we were able to get um, at 0.1%, that's one milliliter per thousand milliliters. One drop per thousand drops. So it's extremely diluted. And it also increased the lifespans of bees over baseline, you know, nearly double at a time critical period. Now I've been told uh, by, by, by entomologists studying bees that the normal foraging time for worker bees is about nine days, but now nationally it's been shorted to about four days. Uh, because of stress factors, the varroa mite, nurse bees are re prematurely recruited to be worker bees, you know, and it's a doubling down the slippery slope, you know, into, and the colony collapse. So then we started looking, okay, we have longevity factors that increase, but we'll start looking at viral titers. And so with chaga, this one here goes on birch trees, we found from week, uh, the controls, week one to week two, the viruses, you know, skyrocketed. And then at, on a dose dependent basis, as we increase the dosages, the amount of viruses in the bees uh, declined. So, hmm, that's interesting. And then looking at the red reishi, we found something also very similar. The, uh, the viruses will go up in the controls on a, on a dose dependent basis, not this one, but this, you know, primarily the viruses will go down. Now, this is for all vi viruses. It's done with uh, Dave Wick from Montana. Um, so, the summary was wow, oh, okay, we found four species that compared to the rice controls, the viruses went up, and compared to these four species, that we had a general reduction of, of viruses. Now, I have now become a literature hound, and I am reading everything I can on viruses and bees and colony collapse. There's a great chart that I found um, that was published in Science, and now these, all these articles you're gonna see are 2016 articles. This is a spread of the varroa mite, uh, largely from Asia, that, uh, that transmitted the, uh, the deformed wing virus. And in the literature now, um, it's, it's stating that um, the, uh, the, uh, I've read that virtually all bees have viruses, and primarily the deformed wing virus, the Lake Sinai virus, the Black Queen cell virus. So these articles here in 2016, all in the past few months, all identify uh, the deformed wing virus as a primary cause. Some articles say the primary cause, but I'll say a primary cause, cause of colony collapse. So that was very interesting now, because this virus is the one that seems to be the, the big one of greatest concern. So, and this is the deformed wing virus is the leading contender as a causal agent of colony coline. You know, this is by um, a researcher um, uh, by the name of Tehel in 2016. 
And then here is another article in 2016. Our results show there's a global pandemic of the deformed wing virus, and 100% of the colony bees now are infected with the deformed wing virus. Okay. So thank you, Steve Shepard and the Washington State University and the Whittier Foundation that has been funding the research at WSU, because here is the research results that has now, for the first time, being displayed. And this is the, using the same mushrooms you saw before, which had about a 10 to 1 reduction of the deformed wing virus, and this is the latest results. Here it is. Amadou reduces the deformed wing virus more than 1,000 to 1, and the Lake Sinai virus 8 to 1. The red reishi reduces the uh, deformed wing virus 64 to 1, but it's much more potent against the Lake Sinai virus. So this is work that's been done with Jay Evans at the USDA, who's a leading virologist, a bee virologist, and he says, I've never seen any such strong antiviral activity against the bee viruses as it has with Stamus' extracts. And we think we have species specificity. We have different polypore mushrooms that are active, more active against different viruses than the other ones. This, this brings up the idea of bringing, making up cocktails and Bees you know, could be foraging into rotted logs from, uh, that have several of these <coughs> species part of their foray. So then we then tested against the black cell queen virus, black queen cell virus, and lo and behold, chaga and the red reishi reduced these 100 to 1. Now last night, we just received new research from Jay Evans. <laughs> Poor Steve, I'm texting him go, no, I got to know now. <laughs> what this, I want to confirm what the data uh, meant. The data that we just received last night from Jay Evans in three days of putting the extracts into the sugar feed water, we, we, we reduced the Lake Sinai virus by more than a 500 to one in three days. Now, this is extraordinary. Now, I got real excited about this. You know, I'm a Lone Ranger researcher. I have 75 employees. I own 100% of my own company. I grew up in a small town in Ohio. I had a laboratory in my basement. My dream was always to be a scientist living in the country, have my own, own research facility. I'm living my dream. So I did file several patents on this, U.S. patent and international patent. Uh, nine days from now, on October 25th, the patent is, uh, has been approved, is published at the USPTO.gov website. Now, patentability is awarded uh, based on three primary criteria. One, no prior knowledge. Nothing ever published. And at the B conference where I met Jeff, I stood up there and I announced that 800 researchers and beekeepers, has anyone heard ever of bees been attracted to mycelium for immunological benefit. And I, the pregnant pause, and I'll say it here as well, if you have, stand up and tell me where. Because we, they did massive search engines in Chinese, Japanese, Russian, English, uh, French, German, came up with nothing except for me and my book, you know? So, um, so I, I was, you know, so, the, so uh, no prior art, teaching against conventional wisdom. And that's really great because I have critics out there. So I've now taken the Aikido approach where I take my critics and they said, this will never work. And then I go, see, they're teaching against, uh, they're teaching against me. And so this is, I'm teaching against conventional wisdom. So it's a test of patentability. So I cite my critics and my patents when they, <laughs> if I can, they publish them. And so that's another, another test. The third is usefulness. You know, can you uh, have a solution to a problem that's not been addressed? So these are the three criteria. Now, the European Patent Agency, we filed in seven, uh, seven regions, in Canada here, and in, uh, in, uh, in Europe, Eurasia, including Russia, and Australia, and New Zealand. Um, we can scale this. We can make thousands and thousands of gallons of these extracts. And at 0.1% concentration, it's a remarkable reduction in the viruses and extending the longevity of the bees. Now, there's a big caveat for what I'm, about, uh, what I'm gonna say is that to be charitable, you have to be profitable, to be sustainable, to be able to be charitable. My intention is to open source all of these patents for the entire world with all hands on deck. <laughs> but this is, this is what I call, I'm, I'm an environmentalist, but I also grew up in the school of hard knocks, you know, in the woods, and I believe in ecologically rational solutions. They have to be ecologically rational, have to make sense, have to be scalable. These fungi grow in all woodlands of the world. Now, 12,000 years ago, we invented agriculture. What did we do? We started cutting down the trees. I believe that began the not only deforestation, 
but being able to disconnect the immunological networks that are in the ecosystems that benefit many of the individuals, including bees, that we are dependent upon. So I think this is a paradigm shifting discovery. Um, we all grew up with Winnie the Pooh. <laughs> we all knew that bears went into rotted logs because to get honey from beehives. Uh, and when I first got the, the report that a patent was being uh, approved, I, frankly, my ego kind of swelled for about five seconds. Then I said, really? Why am I the first person? Are we really Neanderthals with nuclear weapons? The hubris of science and our egos prevent us from seeing that which is obvious in nature? So I present to you the Stametzian mushroom bee hypothesis. Bear scratches introduce mushroom mycelium. Bees are attracted to rotten logs only for habitat for immunological benefits. They reduce viruses. They provide p-chimeric acids. They reduce xenobiotic toxin exposure because where the mycelium is growing, those toxins are being broken down. Uh, they bolster the general immunity. And this is something I brought up to Steve, and I would love for other researchers, because the deformed wing virus, I used to be a hand glider, uh, and I used to hang glide, and I have a good friend who was a hand glide test pilot, and at 2,000 feet, his kite uh, broke up due to stress failure. He did a tight turn, the kite broke up, he fell 2,000 feet in San Santa Barbara, hit a sand dune, went down, survived, broke a bunch of bones. But I thought to myself, you know, yeah, stress failure. My father was a stress engineer and a certifier for the American Society of Mechanical Engineers. So he talked to me a lot about stress. And I thought, well, if the deformed wings are noticeable by the bees, they would kick those, deform, those defor deformity, deformed bees out of the hive. But what about the sub-threshold observable uh, uh, impairment of the stress strength of the bees' wings? That wouldn't matter necessarily be noticeable. They can foray. Maybe that's why they can only foray for a few days now, half of what they could before, since they, all the bees have the deformed wing virus. What about the tensile strength of the bees just not holding up from the stress of flapping their wings so much? And that's limiting them as well. So, and you know, we can increase longevity. So, folks, there it is. I want to thank you, Washington State University, Steve Shepard, Brandon Taylor, Lori Karras, Nick Nagler, Jennifer Hokum. I want to th thank the Whittier Foundation, Lee Stein, uh, Bryce. Uh, Rhodes, Sue Rhodes, and Emery Rhodes for their contribution, and my employees who are co-collaborators, David Summerlin, Reagan Alley, Henry Mersel, Alex Taylor, Morgan Wolf, Blake Westman, and Bulmaro Solano. I want to thank you very much.